you really believe in all this stuff, don't you? I don't get hung up on believe, not believe. I just accept what is. Three magic lizards. Timekeepers. Created the TVA and everyone in it, right. including you. Including me. You see, every time I start to admire your intelligence, you say something like because that. Because if you think too hard about where any of us came from, who we truly are, it sounds kind of ridiculous. Existence is chaos. Nothing makes any sense, so we try to make some sense of it. And I'm just lucky that the chaos I emerged into gave me all this. My own glorious purpose. <sighs> because the TVA is my life. And it's real because I believe it's real. If you're a Christian and watch all six episodes of Loki, then you may have been able to spot some key Christian principles evident throughout the series. If you haven't, then they were free will and predestination with the Trinity as well in place of the timekeepers. The show out of all other MCU movies and shows is heavily riddled with a lot of religious and biblical undertones. Whether it may be Morbius and Loki seen in the cafeteria about belief or just the character of he remains in general. The sacred timeline or the three timekeepers that governs everyone's destiny, it is riddled with a lot of biblical undertone. So in this video, we'll be going into depth on all of them. And if you missed any that you were able to pick up on, feel free to let us know down in the comments below. So first, we're going to cover some comic book background of He Who Remains. This video is mainly focused on He Who Remains rather than Loki. We would be touching on the references from the show of course as well as speed running through the show's plot for context sake but the main emphasis is on he who remains so do keep that in mind as we continue so for the comic book context we'll be diving into who is nathaniel richards but looking mainly at the he who remains and immortus variants the he who remains variant is said to be the final director of the time variant authority at the citadel at the end of time the last reality of the multiverse. He created a time twister to teach the next universe who inevitably started time traveling into the past and destroying the universe they were currently in. But the time twisters turn out to be bad, so after a story where Thor defeats them and another alternate universe is created, he then creates the time keepers. The Immortus variant has a much deeper history that is extremely loaded but I'll try to condense it. According to the comics, Nathaniel Richards was born in the 30th century of Earth 6311, a reality where humanity never went into the Dark Ages. After centuries of advancement and warfare, peace was brought to the land by a time traveler from Earth 616 named Nathaniel Richards. Because Richards brought peace to the war torn future, he was known as a legendary benefactor. The Nathaniel Richards, born to this reality at the age of 16, seeked self-intervention from his future as Kang the Conqueror. This resulted in young Nathaniel trying to prevent his eventual transformation into Kang by briefly becoming the young hero known as Ironlad. Nathaniel eventually returned to his native time to finally follow his proper destined path, possibly with his memories as Iron Lad erased. As an adult, Nathaniel from Earth 616 discovered a time machine and having grown bored of his peaceful time, traveled back in time to ancient Egypt on Earth 616. Along the storyline, he set himself up as a pharaoh Ramatut until he was ousted from his position by the Fantastic Four. Ramatut tried to flee back to his own era, but he was caught in a time storm and was forced to appear in the modern era of Earth 616. An encounter with Doctor Doom inspired Nathaniel to abandon his Ramatut guys and assume one similar to Doom. He then went on to successfully conquer many various galaxies and time periods, eventually deciding to return to a more simpler time. He turned his vast empire over to his lover Ravana and returned to ancient Egypt, assuming his guise of Ramatut once more. Along the storyline, the so-called Destiny War at the end of time between the Avengers and the Timekeepers occurred. The Destiny event deserves its own video. Immortus was tasked by the Timekeepers to alter the destiny of the human race and prevent them from traveling beyond their solar system. If this happened, then humans would conquer the universe with help from the Avengers. Immortus had to stop the Avengers. If he didn't, the Timekeepers would destroy not only the Avengers, but humans and the Earth. In order to complete this task, 
he soon constructed a fortress and began to study time and tried to master the realm of limbo and observing alternate realities and time lines. He was greeted by the so-called timekeepers who had selected him to be tutored on their secrets of time. As their apprentice, he was given seven millennia to watch over from 3000 BC to 4000 AD. His primary objective was to untangle the temporal disturbances caused by his own self. He was also to shepherd the course of history so that it ended with the timekeepers at the end of time. An interesting quote from the prime Kang the Conqueror about Immortus is, he calls himself the master of time, gardener of time, is more truthful. He prunes away the coronal branches deemed by others to be dangerous, reducing reality to bloodless metal. But that's not the way of warriors, of men. I say, let it be a forest, let it be a jungle. I won't be going into prime Kang the Conqueror as that variant isn't really relevant to what we need to cover in this story. As seen in the Loki TV series, the TVA is rather comic accurate where it was created by He Remains along with being formed with the goal of monitoring reality throughout the multiverse and attempting to keep temporal interference to a minimum. The only difference is the Immortus variant and the Kang the Conqueror variant are more so merged into one variant in the TV series. So let's talk about the sacred timeline which is inspired from the 7 millennia period that Immortus was given to watch over from 3000 BC to 4000 AD by the timekeepers. As we know from what he remains states in the final episode of Loki, he acquired this position after being the dominant variant when compared to all other Nathaniel Richards variants. He remains states that he knows all because he writes it all which is seen in some scenes during the episode where he knew the exact moves of Loki and Sylvie. He stated that he lived through many lives which is parallel to the time. Now that was the relevant comic context, I'm gonna give the synopsis of the show. If you already watched it and just want the biblical parallel explanations, skip over using the video chapters. But for now, we're gonna briefly speedrun the entire plot. Ready? Let's go. Immediately after season of the Tesseract, as a result from the actions of the Time the Space Avengers, Loki is arrested by the Time Variance Authority for creating a branch timeline and is taken into their headquarters. Following an extensive screening process, Judge Ravana Renslayer sentences the Loki to be pruned, but Angel Mobius M intervenes and instead pleads that he could be useful in their operations. Mobius and Loki then have a spiral of conversations and interrogations which leads to Loki contemplating his ability to possess free will in a predetermined timeline, as Mobius shows him his intended future in the sacred timeline. Loki manages to escape and retrieves the confiscated Tesseract. But he discovers it is powerless in the TVA along with the other Infinity Gems as well. When it chases over, Loki then sees his final moment in Endgame and comes to terms with all he has been told. Loki is then recruited by Mobius to respond to a renegade Loki variant who had been attacking the TVA's Minutemen in various time periods, seeking to use their Loki to understand and help capture the variant. After some theory crafting and belief questioning scenes, they figured out how to discern where the variant is most likely to hide, which leads them to a hurricane in 2050 Alabama, to which they find a variant aware of their arrival, a female Loki. She had one of the TVA agents reveal to her the classified location of the creator of the TVA, the Timekeepers, and she was set out on her own plan to kill them. The variant Loki then bombs the sacred timeline using the TVA reset charges and creates multiple branches forcing the TVA into action. At the headquarters, a chase ensues and Loki uses a tempad to transport himself and a variant to 2077 Lamentus 1, a moon doomed to collide with a planet in a few hours. With the device low on power and stuck within Loki, the variant reveals her alias as Sylvie. She is forced to team up with him to survive. Their quest to score for sufficient power sources comes up fruitless but they learn from a Lamentian homestander about the Ark, a spaceship that is too hypothesized to be able to recharge the Tempad. Along the way, Sylvie reveals to Loki that while enchanting C-20 for information on the Timekeepers, she discovered repressed memories of a life C-20 previously had on Earth. Loki learns those who work for the TVA are variants themselves, having been abducted from the sacred timeline. Arriving at the launch base, Loki and Sylvie dash to the Ark but are only able to witness its destruction. Preparing for their demise, the two continue to bond, eventually beginning to hold hands. 
This however creates a unique branch in the sacred timeline and the TVA arrests the duo in the nick of time. Before being thrown into a time cell, Loki informs Mobius of his own variant nature. A confused Mobius then relays this information to B-15, who begins to recognize memories of her own previous life due to Sylvie's enchantment on her. In the time cell, Loki is verbally and physically abused by Sif, continuously in a time loop, eventually forcing him to confess to his narcissism. While celebrating Sylvie's capture with Renslayer, Mobius swaps his tempad out for hers and excuses himself to the library where he finds a recording of C-20 that affirms to him of his variant origins. After retrieving Loki from his temporal incarceration, Mobius is pruned by Renslayer, who had learned of the Tempad swap. She then takes Loki and Sylvie to the Timekeeper's chamber, where the reformed B-15 assists the two to fight. After knocking out Renslayer, Sylvie then uses her weapon to reveal that the Timekeepers were actually phony animatronics. Loki is pruned by Recover Renslayer, which afterwards leads Sylvie to disarming Renslayer and interrogating her on the origins of the TVA, but finds she is also clueless. Instead, Sylvie learns that pruned variants go to a void at the end of time, and Loki is most likely alive there. After a standoff with Renslayer and TVA agents, Sylvie prunes herself and is retrieved by Mobius in the void. Meanwhile, Loki meets other variants of himself as they all run from the storm-like entity named Alaya. Some shenanigans ensues and Loki meets up with Sylvie and Mobius, where they began theorizing that Alaya is only a gatekeeper to the true creator of the TVA. Sylvie comes up with a plan to enchant and neutralize the beast, which is successful, but with the help of the other Lokis. The two cross a portal unveiled from the storm to infiltrate the citadel at the end of time. Encountering Miss Minutes inside, she unsuccessfully tempts them with a personalized offer from the true creator of the TVA, He Who Remains. Loki and Sylvie later meet He Who Remains himself, who informs them that he had orchestrated everything that had happened so far and pursues to chat with them. While they are in the citadel at the headquarters, Renslayer searches for files regarding to the TVA's founding, but instead receives files about He Who Remains. Mobius arrives and informs Renslayer that her variant nature is now known to all due to a coordinated effort between him and B-15. Following an argument regarding the free will of all variants, Mobius attempts to prune Renslayer when she opens a time door, but she easily disarms him. Instead of pruning Mobius again, Renslayer simply leaves the TVA headquarters to find her free will. He who remains reveals to Loki and Sylvie that he had founded the TVA in the aftermath of the Multiverse of War in order to prevent the rise of his malicious variants. He then gives the two a gambit, kill him and unleash his variants or take over the TVA in his place. As the sacred timeline begins to form multiple branches, Sylvie, having lost her family to the TVA, rushes to kill him. But Loki, not wanting to risk the prospect of a multiversal crisis, comes to his protection. After a brief struggle, Loki and Sylvie's emotional bond reaches her apex and they kiss. But Sylvie opens a time door using He Who Remains tempered and sends Loki back to the TVA. He Who Remains, having grown weary, does not resist when Sylvie kills him with the sword. The sacred timeline becomes destroyed, Sylvie collapses in regret over her murder, and Loki is left heartbroken about his lost love. Loki then rushes to the library where he encounters Mobius and B 50, attempting to warn them about variants and He Who Remains. They don't recognize him. Loki then notices a lone statue of a variant of He Remains in place of the three Timekeeper statues, a regime change as a result of the multiversal crisis. The Ovakin plot of Loki can be narrowed down to the search of free will. The term free will is mentioned a lot throughout the show, especially in the final episode. What would happen if we didn't prune the timeline? What? Chaos. Death. Free will? <laughs> free will? Only one person gets free will, the one in charge. A handful of other YouTube creators that have their own videos also agree with this, though from different perspectives such as Wisecrack comparing it to Kafka S, but we will be looking at it from a Christian perspective tackling mainly the sacred timeline. Now before going forward, let's get a song Christian illustration on what free will and predestination is, to which I'll be using an extract from one of my theological leaders who helped me with these videos where she discussed are people predestined to perish are there people predestined to perish 
Throughout the history of Christianity, many believers have struggled to grasp the doctrine of predestination. Did God create some to be saved and some for destruction? No, he did not. Did God predestine some to be saved? Yes, he did. Well, what's the difference? All of humanity deserves eternal punishment because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 We neither deserve nor can we earn eternal life. Yet God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes should not perish but have eternal life. John 3.16 Jesus died for whoever believes. Scripture teaches us that persons are always held responsible for their willful choice to reject the gospel. God has not predetermined individuals to reject Jesus. John chapter 8 verses 43 to 44, Matthew 23, 37, John 5, 40, and Romans 1, 20. Scripture also teaches us that some have been predestined to salvation, Romans 8, 29, 30, and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 5 as well as verse 11. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. The word foreknew, Greek prognosko, is used five times in the New Testament. It means pre-knowing without predetermining. Pre-knowing, knowing before, selecting, approving for relationship. It's like what God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. The word knew indicates a relational knowing rather than an intellectual knowing. It's a knowing based on relationship rather than a knowing based on intellectual facts about a person. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. God pre-knowing relationship-wise and doing so without predetermining. So it means he foreknew individuals, but he did not predetermine or require it to be so. Individuals have a choice in the matter. The word predestine, Greek pro horizo, is used six times in the New Testament. It means to establish or predetermine limits before creation. So in this case, it's God determining from eternity it will be so. So those whom God foreknew, he elected and predetermined, that is determined before creation, that they would be saved. So predestination is based on God foreknowing certain individuals and choosing them to be conformed to the image of his son. Yet these individuals must choose Christ in order to be saved. We are born in sin and fashioned in iniquity. So as individuals in a fallen state, we must choose Christ in order to be saved. Did God not choose the nation of Israel over all other nations to have relationship with? We see this in Amos chapter 3 and verse 2. Does this mean the entire Jewish nation will be saved? No, it does not. Romans chapters 9 and 11 clearly indicates because of their unbelief, only a remnant that is true Israel, the elect of God, will be saved. In like manner, the true church, also the elect of God, will be drawn by the Holy Spirit and able to believe and be saved. God has put everything in place that when the time is right, the elect freely chooses Jesus. After the rapture of the church, during the tribulation, many will also be saved, a great multitude that no one could number. Revelation 9, 7. We may ask the question, if we are predestined, then do we really freely choose? Scripture teaches us that God gave human beings the ability and responsibility to make choices that affect their eternal destiny. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 19 to 29, Romans 10, 9 to 10, and John 8, 24. We must bear in mind that humans live in a world created, governed, sustained, and directed by God, and human free will functions within these parameters. There will be the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming, the millennial reign, and the final judgment. Free choice does not mean one can choose not to participate in these events. Every decision we make is a free choice, but it is limited by how God created us to function. We are limited by our human nature. We have a sinful nature which prevents us from making a choice to become righteous. 
we cannot choose to make ourselves holy neither can we choose not to physically die it is outside of our nature at the same time every day we make free choices and we are held responsible for these choices we get up every day we choose what we wear what we eat we choose our careers we make free choices all the time we make decisions all the time and we are held fully responsible for these choices god does not force us to follow a predetermined course of action so our free will does not mean humans can do anything that pleases them it is limited by our human nature and it functions within the parameters of god's providence and decrees predestination means that god in his sovereignty chooses certain individuals to receive eternal salvation it is not based on a foreknowledge of facts about us neither is it based on our faith nor anything good in us it is based on god's sovereign choice for knowing us in love do we deserve it no can we earn it no left to ourselves would we have chosen him no we chose him because he forced first chose us left to ourselves we choose our own interests we all deserve eternal punishment yet if our eternal destiny is the lake of fire it's not because we have been predestined for it it is because we are sinners deserving of god's judgment scripture does not describe god rejecting anyone who believes those that have been destined, 1 Peter 2 8, designated for condemnation, Jude 4, and are vessels of wrath prepared or fitted for destruction, Romans 9 22, have through their own sin fitted themselves for eternal punishment. Eternal punishment is a choice, eternal life is a gift. Choose wisely. I hope you guys got that. Personally, after hearing that, it really helped me on understanding predestination and free will. But let's dive back into the plot of Loki. According to Hero Remains, the entirety of the MCU is set on a time loop, and all events are forewritten and predetermined where it ends and starts, with Hero Remains winning the multiversal war. This is similar to the comic origin of the 7000 year period where the timekeepers put Immortus as the one to shepherd time and ensure it ends and restarts with the timekeepers. This will mean that the paths and events in the Marvel Universe, even down to the Battle of New York, the snap of Thanos in Infinity War, and the death of Iron Man are all set to be predetermined events. That is set on a time loop, which is the sacred timeline. If they ever stray too far away from their predestined path, then they will be pruned by the TVA and reset. Everyone basically is only fulfilling their destiny of being who they are for the greater picture of he remains, which is seen when Loki is told by Mobius that he was only fulfilling his destiny and the other Lokis accepted this as we see in episode 5. The tenet of free will is probably the most targeted when it comes to attempting to disprove the belief of God. Because we as Christians state that God is omnipotent and omniscient, so how can God know everything but we as humans have free will? Fun fact, the Marvel Cinematic Universe Wiki states that he who remains possesses nigh omniscience up until the threshold. He who remains knew everything in the secret timeline because everything already happened before he came into control of it. A lot of analysis I saw missed this, stating that he wrote everything and pretty much directed everything. But this is not what it is according to proper context as discussed earlier. Because it is set on a time loop, he just ensured that those things kept happening so he could stay in power and in control. To further break down Hero Remains, we'll be touching on some key scenes from the final episode of the show. Starting with Loki's and Sylvie's encounter with Miss Minutes in the Citadel. He was impressed. He who remains. And who is he? He created all. And he controls all. At the end, it is only he who remains. And he wants to offer you a deal. Pay attention to our dialogue as it is important for the final analysis. 
The next scene is Loki and Sylvie actually meeting Hero Remains and their reaction to seeing that he was nothing more than just a man. Now what you were hmm? You're just a man. Hmm? Flesh and blood. Don't feel me with this boy. No. Just a little bit easier to kill. <laughs> Flesh and blood. On to the next scene. In the TVA, when a variant is caught and is about to be put on trial, they have to sign for every single word they ever utter before they are put on trial for their crime of just existing. On to the next scene. Every step you took to get here, Clementus, the void, I paved the road. You. You just walk down it. And I have the rest uh, right here. Everything that's, uh, that's going to happen. There's only one way this can go. But then why are we here? Come on. No, you can't get to the end until you've been chained by the journey. This stuff it needs to happen to get us all in the on the right mindset to finish the, the quest. Right. Right. So it's all a game. It's all a manipulation. Interesting. That your head would go to that. He who remains has access to this as he supposedly built the system and paved the way for Loki and Sylvie's path towards meeting him. On to the final scene I want to touch on. One thing, new lands to be conquered. The peace between realities. <laughs> Erupted into all out war. Each variant fighting to preserve their universe and annihilate the others. It was almost the end, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, of everything and everyone. And then the timekeepers came along and saved us all. No. <laughs> no. No, this is where we diverge from the dogma. That first variant encountered a creature created from all the, the tears in the reality, capable of consuming time and space itself. A creature. You both know. Elias. Bingo. I harnessed the beast power and began experimenting on it. I weaponized Elias. And I ended, I ended the multiversal war. Once I isolated our timeline. All I have to do is manage the flow of time and prevent any further branches. Hence, the TVA. Hence, the timekeepers in a highly efficient bureaucracy. Hence, ages and ages of cosmic harmony. Hence, you're welcome. You're welcome. 
In the comics, it is literally called the War at the End of Time, where the infinite number of Kang variants had an all-out war in the late 31st century. Which you know by now, this Kang variant, according to the MCU, he who remains won the battle and created the TVA, placing three space lizards in control of everyone's destiny. Here is what they consider to be the dogma. Settle in, sharpen your pencils, and check this out. Long ago, there was a vast multiversal war. Countless unique timelines battled each other for supremacy, nearly resulting in the total destruction of, well, everything. But then the all-knowing timekeepers emerged, bringing peace by reorganizing the multiverse into a single timeline, the Sacred Timeline. Now the timekeepers protect and preserve the proper flow of time for everyone and everything. But sometimes people like you veer off the path the timekeepers created. We call those variants. Maybe you started an uprising, or were just late for work. Whatever it was, stepping off your path created a nexus event, which left unchecked could branch off into madness, leading to another multiversal war. But don't worry, to make sure that doesn't happen, the timekeepers created the TVA and all its incredible workers. The TVA has stepped in to fix your mistake and set time back on its predetermined path. Now that your actions have left you without a place on the timeline, you must stand trial for your offenses. So sit tight and we'll get you in front of a judge in no time. Just make sure you have your ticket and you'll be seen by the next available attendant. For all time. Always! Timekeepers, the sacred timeline. Who actually believes this bunkum? Who would believe that? I know this video is long. It is the longest one we ever did and has been in the pipeline for the longest out of all our videos thus far. But we wanted to ensure that every corner of context is covered. The whole plot of Loki is not just a questioning of bureaucracy and authority and government and Kafka-esque and a sci-fi homage piece of work but it is a direct warped parallel to the free will God has given us. Three magic space lizards that created everything in the sacred timeline, governing everyone's destiny and their path in life. The devout followers who could also be considered their foot soldiers believing in their sovereignty without question, calling everything they do on behalf of the sacred timekeepers my own glorious purpose. I mean, it's way too close for it to be denied that it isn't. Obviously, it was inspired by some other sources as well, mixed into it, but denying that that particular source was not part of its inspiration, come on now. Of course, the director obviously won't say that it is, no one at Marvel or Disney either, even though we can clearly see them using this particular source in their material. And because of this, a lot would refute this type of content as a laborious comparison of Christian mythology to Marvel mythology as though there are really that great of reasons to care about the largely arbitrary differences. But this is why we put so much emphasis on covering the source material context. Because when you watch these shows in a vacuum by themselves and go off of interviews and commentary pieces, it's easy to miss that everything which had Jack Kirby at the helm so far that we have covered on this channel has turned out to be some kind of of warped biblical parallel. He remains as portrayed to represent slash mimic God with lines like I know it all and I've seen it all. He created all and he controls all. At the end it is only he who remains. Which are similar to common phrases used by God represented himself throughout the Bible as seen in these scriptures like Isaiah 46, 9 to 10, which says, Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will accomplish all my purpose. 1 John 3, 20 
For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and He knows everything. Psalms 92 Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And Job 36 26. Behold, God is great, and we know Him not. The number of His years is unsearchable. The difference here is that God is supposedly only man in flesh and blood, who came into this knowledge after becoming the victor of a war against infinite versions of himself at the end of time. Rather than being the eternal, all-powerful, all-knowing and loving one we as Christians know today, who doesn't restrict all humans of their free will to stay in control and keep the universe in order. There might be someone out there wondering why do we care so much and go to such lengths to point out parallels or I'm glad there are some sort of Christian themed influence in these shows. And for those people wondering this, it is simply because that is what we are called to do according to Romans 16, 17 to 20, which says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those that cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites and by smooth talk and flattery they deceive the hearts of the naive. For your obedience is known to all, so that I rejoice over you. But I want you to be wise as to what is good and innocent as to what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And Titus 1 from verse 13 to 15, which says, This testimony is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply, that they may be sung in faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure. But to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But both their minds and their consciousness are defiled. They profess to know God, but deny Him by their works. They are detestable disobedient unfit for any good work you may not agree with our opinions or the content we upload on this channel and you may not agree with christianity as a whole due to your reasons research life events etc you are entitled to your own opinions but please keep in mind that your opinions are not always the fact of the matter the evidence and facts and research of source material in this case point and prove that all these things are straight out warped parallels of bible scriptures as mentioned earlier the directors obviously won't say that it is no one at marvel or disney would say that it is either but it is evident in the content that they are producing where their source material gets some of its themes from obviously not all of the source material are war bible scriptures the bible didn't have aliens and blasters and etc the Loki TV series can be said to be a direct critique of belief and free will in the fashion it is much commonly done in the real world. I mean, belief had a four minute scene in episode two. The show was the precursor for Marvel's entire question your belief series, what if? Can it get more direct than that? To end off, the main takeaway we hope you got from this video is that the portrayal of free will in Loki is not how it works with God. I mean, can you imagine if as soon as we did something outside of God's will for us, he sends a whole strike force for us, judges us, and erases us from existence on the spot? Yeah, thank God for his grace indeed. So, we hope you enjoyed it and let us know your thoughts and views in the comments. Subscribe for more Christian breakdowns of your favorite shows, movies, and more. Share this with someone who you think may like the video as well. But keep in mind, these videos are not to tell you what you can and cannot watch, as that is your decision to make. But it is so that you simply, no longer, blindly consume.